So this is our first attempt at an interview on Cracking the Cryptic. Um, this is uh, Cracking the Cryptic's attempt at Fro Fro Frost Nixon, I think. Um, here we have here we have Mark Goodliff, the twelve-time uh, Times Crossword champion. Well done, Mark, for winning again uh, last weekend. And we have collected a whole load of questions from you guys that you'd like to ask Mark. Um, and I've got a few questions of my own as well. Um, so I think we should just kick straight off. Mark, can you hear me? Are you all yes, ready let's go for it. Okay, so um, how do you how did you go about acquiring the vast knowledge that you need to solve all these crosswords? Wow. I mean, I guess the answer is not with any deliberate intent originally, certainly, and uh, and even latterly. It's obviously solving crosswords a lot brings you to uh, understand what sort of level of knowledge is required by them. It also tells you a lot of that knowledge straight away. But other than that, um, I think crosswords have changed a bit since I started doing them when it did help to know reams of poetry and Edwardian literature and things. It, it really doesn't matter so much now. So the knowledge you need now is vocabulary. And by solving crosswords, by solving more difficult crosswords, by looking things up constantly in a dictionary, um, that's really how I've gone about acquiring what I know. But at school, oh, were you... Um, were you sort of always good at English or maths? Did you excel? Yeah, I was quite good at English. I was quite good at maths as well, but uh, the sciences is much less so. Um, language is okay, not, not outstanding. Um, English and maths, though, I was pretty good at. I've always been interested in, in words and etymologies. Um, and when I would be doing something like Latin or Greek, which I had to do at school, which uh, turns out to be quite helpful for some crosswords. Um, I'd always be much more interested in what words they'd helped us understand in English rather than any of the actual tense or grammar rules. And how, how young were you when you started? Um, I think I was in my teens. Uh, as I've said elsewhere, I, I was at a boarding school and there was quite a lot of time available in the evenings and at weekends. We had a couple of broadsheets in the in the house library and my parents had always been crossword solvers and taught me the basic rules but that was where I really spent time learning how to do them and were you always uh, immediately good or was it sort of oh not at all I don't think anybody's good when they start I mean I think you know the first first few crosswords I looked at like anybody I wouldn't have solved a single clue um but you can kind of learn from the answers the next day or or from somebody telling you, if you have a helpful friend, um, what the reasons are why clues mean things. These days, of course, there's blogs on every um, British newspaper puzzle where you can look up exactly why every clue means its answer. And uh, I think that's an incredibly helpful resource. And, of course, cracking the crypto. <laughs> I was going to say. And... Um... Uh, we had a couple of questions asking if you work or have worked in a field where your cryptic solving has come in handy or, or whether even it was the other way around, whether your sort of work has fed back into your um, crossword solving ability. I think the uncomplicated answer is no. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've been um, an accountant for, for pretty much my working career and although there is occasional parts of things to work out or deduce it i wouldn't ever really equate it with puzzle solving so what would you say would be a good way for somebody who was you know they do a few crosswords they're getting a bit better but they want to get really good what should they be doing i mean should they be you know reading hornblower back to back studying vocab lists or i think all of these things are marginal the first and last answers are practice there's no question about that the more you practice the more you get used to um seeing things recur in in crosswords especially with cryptic clues there are very limited ways that um, compilers can, for instance, add the odd letter or two letters into words. And you see these these constant repetitions if you do enough crosswords. Now, I mean, there are things you can do to 
improve your ability to understand clues. I actually think setting crosswords is a very helpful tool to working out the likely parsing of clues, which is a very important skill. So I'd recommend that. You know, I have occasionally said, you know, I've found reading a hornblower helpful, which you're referring to, and um, occasionally I will look at lists of things that I've really struggled with, but those are really marginal items. I, I eventually worked out on Sporkle who the top 100 composers were because I was so bad at composers, oh, classical Jesus. composers. Good grief. So... And do you, in these competitive environments, do you ever get nervous or do you have a sort of comfort level now? Did you ever get nervous? Um, certainly, I think anybody does. When you're sitting down in exam conditions and somebody goes, right, we're probably a minute away from starting now and you can start. Those, those are moments when I think the, the adrenaline either kicks in a bit or the blood rushes faster. But... To be fair, I, I always think it's rather suited me. I, I quite like the slightly pressured conditions. They, I, I think I do slightly better under those than in a fairly casual environment. So I'm perfectly happy with that sort of background. Goodness. And do you, um, do you have a daily regime? How many crosswords are you doing a day at the moment? Uh, I'm, I'm often asked this. And the, the simple answer is one. I do the Times crossword every day. That's the only cryptic crossword I do every day. But the slightly more complicated answer is, well, I do a bit more than that overall. So I will also solve the Times jumbo crossword every week. I will also solve the listener crossword every week. And that in itself might be as many hours as I've put into the daily puzzles. Um, I test self for the Magpie magazine and that's probably um, five or no, I probably solve 10 puzzles a month. So again, that's a couple more a week onto the, the rotor. And then I will do a few others, not very many, but maybe another puzzle a week. So that's about the extent of my cryptic regime now. I think when I was younger and getting very enthusiastic, I might have averaged two puzzles a day, but certainly never more than that. But I guess if you're doing two puzzles a day and they're taking you five minutes each, that's not a great time. Well, it's me. very true. I mean, I really don't spend a lot of time on on practicing cryptic crosswords. People, I think, sometimes imagine that, you know, like a Scrabble a player coming up to a tournament, I'm doing three or four hours a day. and I'm afraid it's just never true. Okay, my goodness. Now, we had uh, one question, which um, uh, I think I know partially the answer to. Are you ever going to come to the American Crossword Tournament? Well, I mean, as, as you will know, I have been twice in the past um, with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've done that a couple of times. I didn't finish particularly high up the field. And that's quite simply because my experience with American puzzles is vastly smaller than either my experience with cryptic puzzles or the experience of good solvers with American puzzles. You know, there are many solvers in the USA doing five, 10 puzzles a day um, and have done for their whole lives. I've done the New York Times crossword each day for the last 10 years and that's about it. So um, I haven't done very well. I, not, I like to think that if I didn't get unlucky these days, I could finish in the top 100, but not never close to challenging for the podium or anything like that. Yeah, and we've discussed before how difficult it would be to create a real world championship of crosswords because the styles are just so crazily different. Yeah, they're two totally different things. I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, I have uh, the utmost respect for the guys who, who win the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament and... Um, I, you know, I think it's presumably mutual that they they know that cryptics are something they just had less practice at. Yeah. So we've got some other good questions here. So somebody wanted to know, are there any words you commonly misspell? Oh, um, I mean, I take quite great pains to make sure that I know spellings. So I don't like to get tripped up. But that in itself as an answer implies that there are words that I have misspelled. Um, 
and known that I've misspelled. I remember once in some sort of environment where somebody went, oh, you know, I'll test you, spell liquefy, and I got it wrong. So there are words like that. Then there are a bunch of words that have alternative spellings. And, you know, whether you're spelling inquire with an E or an I at the beginning, you're not necessarily wrong one way or the other, but people always assume there is only one right answer. And um, you kind of have to know the nuances as well as the actual spellings of, of when one is right and when one is slightly less favoured. But there aren't really... I, I, if I knew a word that I regularly misspelt, I'd fix that. Okay. <laughs> wow. Now, I'd like you to just um, talk a bit about the crossword competition. And in particular, you know, there's a, a sort of semi-final... The, you know, there were two semi-final rounds really before the final you solved both sets of, of semi-final puzzles very quickly and then you were sort of left twiddling your thumbs for the remainder of the time because all of the competitors are given an hour for these puzzles now Mark you finished them what in 18 minutes each time something like that not quite uh, something like that but I, I don't know I was certainly done I think within 20 minutes in each round that's an hour and unlike the american crossword puzzle tournament where everybody leaves as soon as they've finished um for some reason at the times you're forced to sit in the seat for for the full hour um so anybody who's been before and expects to finish them in time knows that they need to bring something else in so this year i was very pleased with myself very smug at the end of the uh the first round i was in i pulled out the listener crossword and solved that entirely and also the Matt Gaffney Weekly American Crossword, which uh, I do. So I got those done during the first round. Still had a few minutes left over waiting for the round to end. And during the second round, as you say, I finished in somewhere slightly under 20 minutes. Um, and in the remaining 40 minutes, I did the days times jumbo cryptic. And also the Samurai Sudoku, the kind of five puzzle Sudoku from the Daily Paper. So I was, I was pretty pleased with that. I mean, it's just <laughs> yeah. absurd. I mean, I think we should just, or it would be interesting for people to hear some of your solving records. I mean, fastest time you've ever solved the listener crossword? Well, the listener, I mean, it's intriguing. The listener, much more than the times, the, the speeds have increased so dramatically over the years. I mean, I can remember when solving a listener within a few hours was a real buzz and like amazing to me that that, that could be done. Then I got so much more used to the formats and the styles. Now, I mean, the listener can have anything in it. So some of the puzzles can be very hard, but certainly the quickest I've ever solved one was about eight minutes when, uh, but it was a very straightforward puzzle. It was barely anything other than a regulation cryptic with something hidden in the grid at the end of it. But uh, I think the statistic that would amaze listener puzzle solvers, and I'm pretty confident this is right, is that my median time now would be somewhere around half an hour. So for half the puzzles that they put out, I'd probably get them done in less than half an hour. Now, that does mean, however, that at the top end, puzzles can take several hours or, you know, even occasionally days, but those are quite rare. Wow. <laughs> um, who would you say, are there any clue writers that you worry about facing? You know, is there somebody either in the dailies or in the listener where you think, uh oh, this one could be challenging? Um, lots of people ask, do you get to recognize individual setters, techniques and styles? And the Times publishes puzzles without a byline, so you don't know who's written them. Um, there have always been claims over the years that certain um, solvers could identify many of the setters. And I think those are pretty bogus. I don't think I can tell in any way who's created a puzzle. I mean, somebody famously once wrote to one of the Times editors and listed out the characteristics of the setters he had identified. Huh. And the, time, the Times editor looked through them all, the puzzles that the guy had named that, this, that had been done by these people, 
And he was almost entirely wrong about every characteristic and every puzzle. So that was quite amusing. Um, I, the one exception I'd say is that there are days when the time seems incredibly hard. And from a little bit of experience, I think those are days when it's normally been set by one of two or three setters. And I'd name um, Richard Rogan, the current Times editor, Dean Mayer, who's sometimes known as Annex in other publications. And sometimes John Grimshaw I found very difficult, although he's a bit more variable. So you kind of know when you've really wrestled with a tough one, it was probably Richard or Dean, but I wouldn't know which one. Uh, what about the other papers? Are there, um, yeah, John I Anderson mean, I, I don't like... really do enough in the other papers to, to know particularly. Paul in The Guardian is, is a very regular um, compiler and has been for 25 years or so. He's, he's always, he's never simple, but he's, ne he's never too tough. Um, there are other compilers in, I think the Independent has a very good stable of compilers where you kind of know you'll get a very satisfying challenge from some of them. Um, some of the Guardian setters don't always obey the kind of conventions as I know them about crossword clues, which, you know, they probably just think makes them more mischievous and exciting. And I just think makes them a bit lazier writing the clues. And they can, they can be very hard because if the clues aren't obeying what you're expecting as rules, then, then it's a bit more random. Yeah, I got you. And do you have, um, you know, if someone was to ask you, what's the best crossword you've ever done? Would you instantly be able to tell them or... Would there be a top five? I don't know. Certainly the ones that stick in the mind would be the ones with themes. Um, so therefore likely from the listener or the magpie. I don't really have an absolute top of the tree. I mean, I, I do a puzzle occasionally and go, oh, that's one of the very best I've done. But I haven't kind of got a list to hand of those that I think are in that category. And what about your own crosswords? Because you've obviously, over the years, become more and more prolific setting puzzles. Um, do you have a favourite of the ones that you've set? It's That's quite difficult. I'm quite precious about them. I like think of all my... It's a bit like asking somebody, who's your favourite child? Mm -hmm. I, there is a reason why I like each of the crosswords I've done. I, I don't have an answer for that either. Goodness me. What about um, favourite clues then? Are you proud of any of the clues you've written? <laughs> At home, miss him. I remember that one. That was very clever. I rate that quite as much as you did. <laughs> um, a, there was a misprint in there for anyone trying to rapidly <laughs> solve it. I don't think you've given a lot of help for that. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not going to give you anything. I don't have any particular favourite Okay, well, what we better do then is uh, we had a number of people submit clues they wanted you to try and solve live. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think you'll like this one. This is a good clue. I think I've heard it before. Um, eight letters. Ready? Yeah. Where Ali G seeks relief after very hot curry. Where Ali G seeks relief. After very, it must be Vindaloo, mustn't it? Because yeah. it's, it's Indaloo as pronounced by Ali G, presumably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that was quite a good clue, I have to say. <laughs> it's it's, a, bit, it's a bit naughty, but okay. Another eight letters. Um, for him, art comes with a cost, unfortunately. For him, art comes with a cost. So we're looking at an anagram of art and a cost, I suppose. Um, castrato. Very That's good. a lovely clue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, Very nice. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the ones I've selected to ask you here, I think they're all, they're all really stunning clues, actually. Um, how about this one, then? Nine letters this time. One mm -hmm. may take issue with rising fish stocks. One may take issue with rising fish stocks. So I'm started. The trouble is, there are so many fish that it's hard to know what you'd be reversing there. I, oh, one may take issue. So 
kidnapper might be taking your issue and then you've got kipper and and rising inside it wow that is tough that's tough very well cold <laughs> sold there yeah i mean maybe we should just talk before we go on to the last two or three clues um my own experience watching you solve over the years is very much that i mean obviously you're a brilliant cold solver of clues so that's cold solving means solving a clue with no letters but when you get letters you have a very unusual i think ability to sort of in your mind envision all the possible words that can go into that gap. Yeah, I think that's true. I don't actually think of myself as a particularly brilliant cold solver. Like, so the idea of you reading out eight and nine letter clues is rather scary to me with yeah, no yeah, letters yeah. of the grid. But if you were telling me S blank, L blank, N blank, I blank, you know, I could immediately go, well, it's either going to be splendid or solenoid. And, you know, I'd have some idea. <laughs> yeah, you see, I think for a lot of people that will be, whoa, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go back to our clues then. This is a nice one. This is four, five, mm -hmm. club seals and we'd get hides. Club seals and we get hides. Well, club seals is... Club, nine letters club seals and weed get hides oh and weed get hides oh there's an there's a hidden in there isn't there that's a sand wedge is the club that's yeah hidden in seals and weed and, get yeah that's that, beautiful very another good clue <laughs> um okay one more five letters this time uh once again prime ministers back in the papers five letters did you yeah. say once again, Prime Minister's back in the papers. MPM's back. Prime Minister's back. There's so many possibilities. I, I can't immediately see where we're going with that one. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll give I think I'm beaten there. <laughs> Once again, prime is the definition there. Re five letters. Yep. So, prime minister's back in the papers. Now, I have to say to the people watching this, you will not see this very often. Look at his <laughs> face here. Look at his face. He's actually having to think about a crossword clue. Oh, to prime is. It can't be re-aim, because I don't think that's a word. Refills too long. Prime. Re-pot. Prime Minister's back in the papers. Reams? Why would that be? No, you're saying, once again, prime is... Yeah, that's the definition. Definition. Re-ram? An anagram of that. Rearm. Okay, that can mean once again prime. Oh, well, I was doing the right thing. I was putting the ministers back, the letter R in ream, but I put it in the wrong place. <laughs> so, yes, rearm is... That's, that's very clever, and that's quite difficult, but shouldn't be all that difficult. It's a nice example of a clue. It's a nice clue. Now, the last clue is a bit unfair, in my opinion, but I'll ask it to you because it was, it's was it been sent <coughs> in by a viewer. Um, this comes from a Terry Pratchett book, apparently. It was in a footnote in a Terry Pratchett book. Um, and nine letters. Shaken players carry the load. I mean, it's a, it's a naughty clue, but it's... I, I I think I know that, actually. That is going to be cart horse. I think you're right. So, so it's, it's, it wouldn't be allowed as a no. clue in, in any reputable paper these days. And that's often the problem. I'll explain the clue in a moment. But it's often the problem when novelists put clues in in their books is that nobody's vetting them or testing them and accepting them by normal standards. And I've seen that before in other, in other books. But... Um, I think what's going on there is there's a classic nine letter anagram which excites people of cart horse being an anagram of orchestra 
So those are the players that if they get, if you shake up the word orchestra, you get um, cart horse, which is something that could carry the load. Now, the reason that the, what's called an indirect anagram isn't really considered fair by crossword editors and solvers is there are so many possibilities for what players could be in that clue. That it, you know, orchestra is one of them, but you could name all sorts of players from anything else. So the standard rules are, or the conventions are, that you have to put the actual letters of the anagram in the clue. Otherwise, it's not considered fair. Yeah. Yeah. I fully agree. I fully agree. Now, in terms of like continuing to sort of reign supreme over the world in cryptic crosswords, is there anyone that you're worried about? Is there any anyone that you think? Gosh. Oh, definitely. I mean, people think you know because I've won it a few times that I'm a certain it's easy. Um, there are some people who are quicker than me on a very regular basis. Now, the Times Crossword Club website has. Um, <clears throat> it records the times of people on an individual daily basis. And although there's a few people who are clearly pre-solving the puzzle and then filling the num filling the letters in, and one gets to know who they are and discount the times, but there are three or four sol solvers who regularly beat me on there. Um, John McCabe, who was in the final with me this time, Jason James, who qualified for it and then left to uh, sing in a choir, quite strangely, rather than taking part in the final. And uh, Matthew Marcus, who very nearly qualified for it, solved the final puzzle in the audience and finished in the same time as I did. You know, any one of those could easily beat me over over one puzzle at any time or, or more. So, yes, I'm certainly very nervous that, that sooner or later, probably sooner, one of them's certainly going to beat me. Yeah, I think yeah. On, on the other hand most observers would say that you must be the best cryptic crossword solver of all time or certainly in the top two um so the times are obviously doing something right in the fact that you you know they are right. identifying you each year well, most years as the winner um, well, that's quite a circular argument i'm the winner by what they're doing but maybe there are other solvers who think well? If they would just do something sensible, I'd have a real chance. <laughs> but I, I was that. Well, that was going to be the last question. I wondered if there was, you know, if you'd have any, if you were doing the Times Crossword Championship, how would you do it differently, or would you do you think they've got it about right now with the new changes? Um, oh, that's interesting. I haven't really thought about that. I mean, for my personal preference, I don't think the odd wrong answer should be penalised by effectively complete disqualification i think there would be a oh, minute i agree with that <laughs> two or three <laughs> there would be some minutes of penalty for a wrong answer but um apart from that i mean i think the the, the one puzzle shootout although it makes it a bit a bit more of a lottery i think it certainly adds drama in a good way mm. so that may be the, the way to go i don't know really and what about having, um, you know, headphones on for the, that final puzzle? You're uh, hearing white well, noise. And white boards, like the American crossword puzzle to the final. And commentary. It's, it's certainly a thought, but it would. I think a lot of cryptic solvers would find it unnecessarily um, over-dramatised and, and very off-putting to suddenly put on headphones and have white noise. But I don't know. It may be worth a go. <laughs> I hope we see it. I hope we see it one time at least. That would be. It would be fun to see. Um, <laughs> well, Mark, I think that's it. We've gone through the questions. Thank you very Excellent. much for spending the time talking to us and telling us your secrets. Uh, even if uh, I think hopefully we'll see Liquify making many appearances in <laughs> future tournament puzzles. <laughs> Well, obviously a pleasure. I hope it don't come across as too annoying. <laughs> not at all. Not at all, he says. Uh... <laughs> all right, and we'll see you soon on Cracking the Cryptic.